Hello, everybody, and welcome to An Empty Sanctuary. Uh, as I'm speaking to you, I'm taking a little bit of a break from the church uh, work day and pine needle sale that's going on outside. I've got my gloves on. I'm going to take them off now. I really did spread some pine needles, but others are working away, and it's looking really great outside. Uh, obviously, we are in an empty sanctuary, and uh, uh, that's because we are sending you this message as one of several ways to help us stay connected, to stay connected uh, during this very extraordinary time when our uh, church uh, congregation, our community of faith, along with millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands of others, are uh, trying to join in our national effort uh, to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus, the coronavirus. And so we have, in fact, uh, canceled all church activities for tomorrow, March 15th, uh, and the next Sunday, March 22nd, uh, and then in between. We're not going to have our Wednesday evening fellowship meal. We're canceling some other gatherings. The emphasis is on any gatherings of people that are coming together in a smaller space and staying together over a period of time. And so we're seeing, as you are, and I do too, watch the national and local media, uh, and uh, we're seeing this extraordinary effort in our country and in our society uh, to take action against this, uh, this health threat that we're living with that is obviously worldwide. But we're doing all that we can here, and I'm sensing, as you may be sensing, a remarkable spirit of community and unity uh, and can do, a sense that we can do something to make a difference. And we can help slow the spread of this disease and uh, take care with each other so that we're uh, protecting our most vulnerable parts of the population. Uh, folks who are sick, folks who have pre-existing conditions, health conditions, older folk. Uh, and so we're trying to respect that and respect the social distancing uh, that we're being asked to observe. And that's why we're coming up with this and other ways uh, through the virtual world and virtual media uh, to help us stay connected. And so that's what this is all about, uh, sending you this message uh, that you can watch tomorrow and we'll be recording other messages next week and for next Sunday uh, for you to stay connected. You can also go to our church app or our church website and you can uh, download previous uh, recordings of previous sermons and worship services. Uh, you can read them uh, uh, in print if you'd like. In case you missed a Sunday recently and would like to catch up, that's a great way to do that. I want to thank our church staff and especially Dana Bird for her help. Uh, Dana's our uh, media and communications administrator, and she's helping us uh, with this uh, greatly. So uh, we are continuing our series that we've been in the midst of uh, based on Adam Hamilton's book, The Walk, as we're considering five essential practices of discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus. And so this week, we're considering what it means to serve, to serve in the name of Christ and as a follower of Jesus. So I want to share some scripture with you and uh, that we would have been hearing in our worship services today. And so you can uh, follow along if you have your Bible uh, with you, but if not, just listen. And first I'm reading the Old Testament lesson from Micah uh, chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings or with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, or the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? And our uh, gospel lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 20. I'm reading beginning with verse 25. But Jesus called the disciples to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as a son of man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, the giving and receiving of your word, that we might hear it and take it to heart, and that we might consider deeply what it means to follow you in Christ Jesus. 
In his name we pray. Amen. So, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are talking one day. And they see the handwriting on the wall as they're following Jesus and they're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. They know something big is up. They sense something big is about to happen. And even uh, as they decide that this is happening, they think the time is right to get in good with the master. And, and they even enlist their mother for help. They get their mom involved. And this passage probably has fed the stereotype about not just Jewish mothers, but all mothers who advocate sometimes over the top for their children. So the mother of James and John comes to Jesus, kneels down, gets on her knees, and asks this one favor. Lord, let my boys, you know they're such good boys. They've left everything to follow you. They've left the business to their father and me. They've followed you wherever you've gone. They're such good boys. Let them have a place in your kingdom, a place of honor in your kingdom. Could you do this one thing just, just for me, their mother? And Jesus replies, do you know what you're asking? Really? To drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they say. Yes, Lord, we're able. Someone even wrote a hymn about that. Are ye able? And then Jesus proceeds to remind them and all of us what it truly means to follow him. The great and powerful of this world, he says, lord it over those beneath them, but not so with you. You want to be great? You want to be great in my kingdom? Then be a servant. And I am among you as one who serves. The gospel according to John goes even further. And we're told in John 13 that as Jesus gathered with his disciples the last night of his public life, his, uh, his public ministry, uh, he uh, did something very unusual. As they were celebrating their last meal together during the Last Supper. You see, in those days, uh, folks wore sandals and walked at most everywhere they went on dusty, dirty roads. And it was very typical that one would remove one's sandals and wash one's feet before entering a, a home, particularly to share in a meal. And people of means had servants who would uh, be ready as the guests arrived to remove their sandals and wash their feet before they would then recline around the table for a banquet. Yes, wash their feet, smelly, dirty, cracked, blistery feet. Uh, and that was always done before a meal. So Jesus, as he gathered around that table with his disciples, he took up a towel and a basin and he went around and washed each of their feet in an act of humble service, an act of love. Uh, the disciples were uncomfortable with this. Peter even said, you'll not wash my feet. But Jesus said, if you don't let me do this, you can have no part of me. And so he went around and washed all their feet. The Hebrew word for what Jesus is about is chesed. It's translated mercy or better, loving kindness. Micah used this very same word in his famous passage about what the Lord requires of us to love mercy, chesed, loving kindness, to do justice and to walk humbly with God. So that is a great word for us as we consider what it means to serve in the name of Jesus, to serve as his followers. That word is kindness. Most of us can relate to being kind. Most of us uh, recognize kindness when we see it, when we feel it, when it's offered to us. And we know when it's not there. Kindness has legs. Kindness has a sweet strength that's like nothing else. It is the means of love. I'll always remember a beautiful example that was shared with me by a colleague many years ago. A couple in his congregation had shared a prayer with him that their little girl had prayed one evening that, or that week before, before Sunday. And the prayer went like this, Lord, let the bad people be good and let the good people be kind. Lord, let the bad people be good and let the good people be kind. You know, it's no accident that our youth and, and all those who are supporting them will be wearing and are already are wearing long sleeve t-shirts uh, this winter and spring as they prepare for their upcoming mission trips this summer. And uh, those shirts say in part, be kind. Be kind. Some of them say, do good. 
and others will say, do no harm. But the, the one you'll see most is the one that says, be kind. How well that brings together the first two of John Wesley's general rules. The first, do no harm. And the second, do all the good that you can. And if we're practicing kindness, then we're, we're covering uh, what John Wesley had in mind, and more importantly, what Jesus had in mind when he invited us to follow him as his servants and to be servants one to another. So in keeping with these five essential practices we've been talking about from Adam Hamilton's book, The Walk, uh, and what it means to follow Jesus, we consider offering five acts of kindness each week. As with prayer and study, we can use the fingers of one hand to serve as a reminder. Uh, we've done that with uh, prayer, to pray five times a day. We've done it with a study, to read five uh, scripture passages each day. And now we consider doing five acts of kindness each week. Sometimes we teach our children to pray using the fingers of one hand. And we can do the same thing with our acts of kindness, our acts of kind service. Use your thumb to remind you to pray for those who support you, your family and friends and close loved ones. Use your pointer finger to remind you to offer kindness to those who uh, point you to the light, point you to God, teachers and other servants. Use your middle finger or your longest finger uh, to pray for and offer kindness to our leaders. What if every one of us offered a note, uh, sent an email of thanks and appreciation to our elected leaders locally and in the state level and even the national level, instead of complaining, instead of trying to tell them what to do, but just offer a, a, an act of kindness to those who lead us. Let your next finger or ring finger uh, remind you to offer kindness to those who are weakest, who are lost, who are forgotten, who are overlooked, who are sick or in prison. Jesus had some specific things to say about offering kindness to those folks, the least of these. He said, when you offer kindness to them, you're offering kindness to me, to Jesus. Let your pinky finger or smallest finger remind you to offer kindness to those who serve you, the folks who clean our homes and our neighborhoods, remove our trash, serve us in stores, restaurants, and anywhere else that we may go on a regular basis. You know, sometimes their hours are long and their lives are difficult and their circumstances are hard and they don't always get a lot of appreciation. We may leave them a tip sometimes, but we rarely offer any uh, specific or express signs of kindness. So remember those folks in your world and offer kindness to them as well. Five acts of kindness each week. Adam Hamilton suggests that we consider how quickly and powerfully our weekly acts of kindness and service can multiply. In round numbers, if we take our average worship weekly attendance uh, of say 400 people uh, a week are worshiping here uh, at Jamestown United Methodist Church, multiply that times 52, the number of weeks in a year, and multiply that times five, the acts of kindness that we're going to practice each week. And that comes to 104,000 acts of kindness a year just from our congregation. Multiply that times all the Christian congregations throughout the country. And we'd be talking about millions and millions and millions of acts of kindness every year. Just imagine what a difference that could make in the name of Jesus. So to strengthen our commitment and resolve to be kind and offer acts of kindness, loving kindness in the name of our Lord, I'd like to invite you to join me as we end this time together in a special covenant prayer that John Wesley wrote for the early Methodists to pray. Often Methodists have used this prayer uh, on New Year's Eve or day as a way to uh, resolve, if you will, or uh, rededicate themselves to serve uh, uh, as disciples of Christ Jesus. And so I invite you to just pray silently along as I pray it out loud. Let us pray. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and your disposal. 
And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Have a peaceful week. Have a good week. And we'll look forward to the next time we could connect.